Hello, Daniel and Kelly. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Hi, Bob. I'm doing fine. Thanks for joining me. Let me introduce this. Uh, this is The Right Show. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, and you are Kelly Vlahos and Daniel Larison. I actually want to start by doing something I don't do all that often, uh, but which is to recommend that people, as we say these days, consume your content. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is, first of all, this is going to be a, a kind of a year-end foreign policy retrospective. And uh, you two have been uh, selected through an elaborate screening process. <laughs> I searched for the finest minds in foreign policy. As you know, there was a competition. And, and thank you both for spending hours and hours on your, your entry essay. Um, the, uh, but, uh, you know, seriously, uh, for starters, Daniel, your newsletter, Unomia, uh, is right. something I recommend to everyone. On Substack, E U N O M I A. Right. Uh, what, what is it? What, tell us a, just quickly, what, where does that name come from? So, the, the, I chose that name. The, uh, this was the name of my blog originally, long ago when I first got started. And it just means uh, good order or the principle of good order. And it, it comes out of Greek antiquity originally and then gets repurposed over the, the centuries. Uh, but it, it basically reflects the idea of, of a, a well ordered. Uh, justly governed polity, uh, okay. which we, I think we're all uh, hoping to have someday. Sounds good. I'm in favor of that. <laughs> uh, so it's it, the newsletter. You 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 post a lot of stuff. It seems like it comes out at least daily. I don't know, but but uh, you know you you do pretty short uh, but uh, substantial takes. You have a very wide range of knowledge. I find myself uh, almost invariably in sympathy with your takes. Uh, so, uh, I, I recommend that, uh, and, uh, although this won't air until, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, gift subscriptions can be given, uh, Ooh, on Substack. There is a, there true. is a, there's a paid edition of your, your newsletter and, you know, as long as we're plugging stuff, you could give a gift subscription of the non-zero newsletter, couldn't you? Anyway, That's right. on to, uh, your content. Kelly. So yes. uh, you are at Responsible Statecraft, which is the kind of media outlet of the Quincy Institute mm -hmm. uh, for Responsible Statecraft. And you guys, uh, of course, this is multiple voices. You're publishing a number of people, so you can put out right. even more content than Daniel, uh, mm -hmm. including some, some long takes, but uh, a great variety of uh, people who are often, you know, uh, have... have great expertise in the areas they're writing about, and what you two have in common uh, between You Know Me and Responsible Statecraft is that it's, a, it's an alternative take. I think the three of us agree it shouldn't be. You know, this should be uh, the kinds of perspectives uh, we see from, from you should uh, be featured more often in mainstream media and elite media like the New York Times and so on, and, and elite foreign uh, policy publications like foreign affairs, and every once in a while they are. It, it's not a completely closed ecosystem. This thing we refer to as the blob, but uh, you know, it, it really. I really recommend that 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 uh, people read your stuff and uh, listen to your podcast. The podcast you two do called Crashing the War Party. Now, um, we're so we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, the year in foreign policy. I wanted to first, though, um, ask you guys a, a kind of a background question. You both come out of the conservative side of things. I don't. One, one of the interesting things about this, this uh, foreign policy moment, where there is a kind of a coalescing coalition that wants to push an alternative approach to foreign policy compared to what has come from this, the so-called blob, uh, is that it is, uh, you know, it's kind of bipartisan and trans ideological in certain respects, but uh, there, but there's a pretty big zone of agreement between some people on the left, some people on the right uh, about an, uh, uh, an alternative view of foreign policy. You both were for a while at the American Conservative, uh, which uh, was, I guess, founded by Pat Buchanan, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Co-founded. He, he was one of the, uh, the three original co-founders, I, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so, so do you, if you want to talk a little about, uh, about that, uh, or, or what, uh, including what parts of, uh, 
a Buchananite uh, worldview you think the foreign policy stuff taps into, whatever you want to say. Because, you know, we should say Buchanan uh, is considered something of a precursor of Donald Trump ideologically in some right. respects. He was he was, uh, you know, very skeptical of, of immigration and, and, and free trade and things like that. Um, and uh, and uh, very much a non-interventionist on foreign policy, as I recall. That, of course, is the part of Trump that, uh, well, did, perhaps it was not entirely <laughs> realized in actual policy, that last part. Anyway, right. is there anything you guys want to say about your uh, where you come from, so to speak? Uh, sure, I, I'll start, if that's okay, Kelly. Um, so I, I, was, I was interested in uh, sort of anti-war conservative ideas even before TAC was founded uh, back in, in 02. Uh, and, then I, and I was an early subscriber to the magazine then. Uh, and then, of course, later I ended up writing for them for many years. Uh, and and what I found most appealing about Buchanan's platform, I, I can I think it's not a secret that I actually voted for him in two thousand. Uh, you know, one of the few people who did. Um, one of the things I found appealing about his platform uh, was specifically the foreign policy message that he was presenting to the country uh, in 1999 and 2000. Uh, this was a time when the U.S. was in its so-called unipolar moment. Uh, we had just bombed Yugoslavia for two and a half months uh, in, in flagrant violation of international law, but nobody cared about that at the time. This is the Kosovo intervention? Right, that's the one. And, and that was, I think that was the intervention that kind of radicalized me and turned me towards the anti-war, uh, anti-interventionist tradition. And, and Buchanan came out uh, with his book, uh, Republic Not an Empire, I think that same year. Uh, and it was intended to sort of as, as the book to provide the, his case for, for the alternative foreign policy that he had in mind. Uh, and, and that was, I think, very influential in my early thinking about this question. Uh, is, you know, do, do we want to be a constitutional self-governing republic uh, that respects other nations, or are we going to be an empire that tries to dictate to them? And uh, so that, that idea served as sort of the foundation for, for the rest of my foreign policy writing going forward. And so, uh, yeah, my views aligned very closely with that, that early uh, sort of Buchananite foreign policy. Uh, and one of the things that I, I found kind of interesting as Trump came to the fore is that while he, uh, he was at least rhetorically sounding like Buchanan in some ways when he talked about foreign policy, in terms of his policy prescriptions, uh, as I think we all would agree, uh, he diverged quite wildly from uh, what Buchanan would have supported in the past and I think what he still supports today. And so you, you end up with this uh, kind of weird uh, fusion of a lot of Buchananite rhetoric uh, and very, very hawkish, even hardline foreign policy positions on almost every issue. And so it, it created a lot of confusion. And I think, I think a lot of people were, were too taken in by the rhetoric and they stopped paying attention to what he was actually doing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and you know, up, up to and including the slogan that Buchanan co-opted, America first, right? When, when his foreign policy has basically zero to do with anything connected with the America first tradition going back into the interwar period. So it was, it was just, it was a very strange kind of fusion that was going on there. Yeah. So Kelly, uh, how long, how long had you, you been at TAC at the American conservative? Well, I've been writing uh, for TAC since 2007 Okay. and then worked in the office proper as managing editor and executive editor from to the late 2017 and until last year, 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's this favorite COVID year. is a it's very, a, uh, I'm a just blur, very, yeah. uh, it's very blurry and muddy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started off as a writer. Uh, for uh, the, the magazine, basically focusing on national security, war, civil liberties, veterans, um, the global war on terror. Um, I had been working at foxnews.com as a political writer when 9-11 happened and found myself in the situation in which I had been working in conservative circles for some time. I'm an independent 
and an independent writer, but that's kind of where I fell when I came to Washington eventually. A lot of my friends are conservative, and I was hired by a libertarian who was at Fox News Channel at the time. Uh, so when 9-11 hit and there had been a mobilization uh, for war and, uh, and a global war on terror and a homeland security policy at home uh, that I found uh, very alarming, I, I found myself working at a place that had instead uh, been uh, you know, circling the wagons around George Bush and supporting everything that he did, the administration, Republican Party. And so it was very awkward uh, because I had found uh, that I had more in agreement at that moment with Ron Paul, who was uh, raising the alarms ab about the the um, the Patriot Act and some of the, the the domestic security policies that were happening in the wake of 9-11, as well as uh, the war drums that were banging. Uh, not only for Afghanistan and continued involvement there, but then the neoconservative drive to a rock and, and invading and deposing Saddam Hussein. So uh, I looked around and I really needed an outlet for, for writing and I couldn't do it at Fox. I was becoming com uh, limited and I was basically doing news uh, writing, polit political writing. So there wasn't much I can do. I hadn't been, been really involved in opinion writing at that point. So I started working, um, doing some side writing for antiwar.com, which as uh, you know, mm -hmm. it was started by Eric Garris and um, uh, why can't I remember, J Justin Raimondo. Justin, who, who, yeah, who, passed, who passed away passed within away the last uh, couple of years. A couple of years, um, who both of them in the 90s, they are longtime libertarians in the San Francisco Bay Area and had started antiwar.com during uh, those the Kosovo war. I believe um, it could have been, yeah, it was the uh, late nineties and uh, had been very um, de you know, dedicated to uh, non-interventionist uh, you know, writing and policy uh, prescriptions from the, the, the libertarian right. Mm -hmm. But as you know, that many in the, on, on the left are also big antiwar.com uh, readers. So I was able to, to flex a little bit there and then I found that, you know what, even though my views about the war lined up with the left, nobody wanted to publish me on the left because I had this stigma for being mm -hmm. at Fox News. And mm -hmm. so I, again, found, um, like Daniel, that the American conservative uh, at that point was, a, was becoming a real hub for writers who on the left and the right, who didn't really, they were sort of misfit for the, the partisan mainstream journalism uh, world. And um, I found a, a family there in, in terms of being able to write about these issues uh, for a broader, not just a conservative audience, but a broader audience of, of independent thinkers and readers and people who wanted to get out from the bubble of what the mainstream media was um, peddling at the time. and so. Um, I found that, you know, whatever anybody might think about Pat Buchanan's politics, that he really created a, um, a community of people at a time when, as you know, it was pretty much impossible to dissent from the popular uh, view, whether it be the liberal internationalism that the Democrats and, you know, democracy pro promotion on the, on the left or the hawkish Cold War thinking and neoconservatism on the right. There really needed to be a place where people could write and express themselves that didn't ascribe to those two sides. And, I, and I'm proud that the American conservative is right all the way down the line. And there are very few um, magazines and outlets on the left that could say the same. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm exaggerating there because, I mean, you've been doing this work for years, Bob, um, and Consortium News, as well as, as, as other outlets have been integral into, into keeping independent writing alive. But even the, the, the lefty places had caved when Obama took over, and all of a sudden they didn't want to talk about anti-war issues anymore. So, you know, politics reigns in Washington, and I'm proud to be part of organizations that sort of go transcend that. Yeah, the, the coming of Quincy is is a really uh, 
welcome development to have a you know a serious think tank with with real resources that isn't saying doing what most of the other think tanks are doing. You know, I had forgotten uh, that Buchanan's framing was a republic, not an empire, because empire is a framing I associate with the left. I don't actually use the word much myself for reasons I won't I won't I won't bother with. But but I had forgotten that. Now, the, the mentioning the Kosovo intervention reminds me of something that in a way highlights, I guess, a, what may be a continuing different difference between left and right uh, on this issue. At the time of the Kosovo intervention. I wrote a New York Times op-ed piece that was skeptical of it. Uh, Honestly, it might have been more full-throatedly critical of it had it not been the case that Bill Clinton had just started saying really nice things about my book, Non-Zero. It was like an (laughs) awkward moment for me to trash the administration. But I did did write this piece just kind of pointing out. I just kind of said, like, look, okay, like, you know, I guess you want to do this intervention. You're called. But I would remind you of something, which is that uh, we've had... Uh, a couple of interventions uh, uh, over the last, since the end of the Cold War, Persian Gulf War uh, and the Bosnia intervention, uh, both of which complied with the UN charter in the sense that, I mean, uh, the the Persian Gulf War was straightforward rollback of trans-border aggression. In my mind, the main thing the United Nations was designed to stop, actual war against another country. uh, Bosnia technically was because the, the border at that point uh, between Bosnia and Serbia had been recognized internationally. So the Security Council said, this is trans-border aggression. And so you're entitled. So I said, I, I said like, so those things were, were uh, at, at least in a technical sense, true to the spirit of, of the UN Charter. You, you focus on stopping trans-border aggression. You grant a lot of, the, you respect the sovereignty of nations. The UN wasn't originally about getting involved in their internal affairs, you know, uh, whereas with Kosovo, A, you're doing it without United Nations authorization, and B, you are, you know, you're getting involved in basically a civil war, uh, and, and uh, you're intervening internally uh, in, in, in a nation, uh, you know, as was done with uh, Syria by proxy later under the Obama administration, and uh, so that, so, so that was a very much kind of a, a lefty take in the sense that it was kind of obsessed with international law, very pro-UN. Uh, and, and I think maybe that is still something of a difference. Although I got to say, I, I, I notice, uh, uh, Daniel, in your stuff, you come out of a conservative background. You do. You do. So you use the term international law in a, in a, in a, in a positive way. That's I'm, yeah. I'm very happy to see that happen. Now, Kelly, of course, we also see that in responsible statecraft. But we should say that responsible statecraft is a trans ideological kind of uh, not bipartisan, strictly speaking. But there is both funding from the left and the right. And there are people from the left and the right. So that's a little a little less surprising that I, I'd see it in, in that mix. But yeah. Uh, but anyway, that this is what I think of as a little bit of a difference of emphasis. But I got to say, when I read uh, the stuff, you know, that, that both of you are are generating and listen to your podcast, it seems to me that certainly for purposes of of talking about the current direction of foreign, American foreign policy, there aren't a lot of differences between left and right. Now, maybe after victory, when the blob is vanquished, you know how these things work, you know, we'll have a civil war and talk about how important the UN should be or something. But right now, it seems to me, uh, our agenda is, is, uh, there's a lot of overlap. I I think that's right, because there are a lot of things in common. I mean, one of the things that I I find important about, I mean, the reason I talk about international law as often as I do, and it probably, probably seems almost quaint, uh, in, in some sense, because Obviously, the U.S. isn't going to be bound by international law if it doesn't want to be, because it's, it's a permanent member of the Security Council. It can get away with it if it mm-hmm. wants. But it, but if it if it would actually adhere meaning to that, that it has it has veto power as a permanent member, it can right. it can right. keep the Security Council, which is the only truly, uh, you know, author- forceful in, in, ter- in legal terms part of the UN in a certain sense. The General Assembly isn't, and the UN can the U.S. and four other countries can veto anything that goes through there. So sorry, go ahead. Right. No, right. And so that that's what essentially keeps the U.S. from ever being labeled as an aggressor, even when it commits obvious uh, breaches of international law, right. invades other countries, topples their governments, and so on. Uh, and so uh, the reason that I emphasize international law as much as I do is that 
Uh, I mean, for one thing, the UN Charter has the force of law. It is, we ratified it as a treaty. We're supposed to be, we're obligated to adhere to it. And so, you know, just from that perspective, I, I think it's important. Uh, and I also think it's important because international law serves as an important break on militarism uh, in general, but also you know, especially for U.S. militarism, which has been, um, if anything, a growing problem since the end of the Cold War, uh, because there are so few checks on it, uh, and we we don't have we don't really have an effective check from Congress because they won't exercise their responsibilities, and we don't have an effective check uh, from our allies because usually they'll they'll go along with whatever misguided scheme we come up with. And so the international law really is the a, a way to, to try to contain or constrain uh, that that impulse to constantly attack. And so that I, that's that's why I uh, bring it up as often as I do. Okay, Kelly, you were going to say something. Oh no! Well, I you know I you know I'm most proud of my work at responsible statecraft and trying to create uh, and I. I'll, I'll use this for a lack of better phrase, a safe space uh, for both re, you know, conservatives and liberals to come to talk and learn and um, get you know, schooled or educated on different uh, issues and foreign policy without feeling that they are being force fed um, the language of Democrats, Republicans, left, right in this current polarized environment. What does that mean? It means that uh, we are transpartisan. I take it very seriously. And that when I want to read about uh, foreign policy or national security issues, I don't want to feel as though I'm being led by the hand uh, by a political agenda. And in, this, in today's environment, uh, language on uh, dog whistles and all the rest uh, are prevalent in every media outlet and Twitter, uh, Facebook, wherever you go you know within five seconds whether the writer is coming from the left or the right. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that has created, as we all know, these different silos and people go to where they feel comfortable and they're gonna hear where at their point of view and basically you know, and, and indulge in the echo chamber. I don't wanna be an echo chamber. I don't want responsible statecraft to be an echo chamber. So I was brought on at Quincy to sort of bridge the gap and really sort of, um, um, you know, um, you know, expand this transpartisan mission. It's not just about the funding, like who funds the Quincy Institute. Mm -hmm. It's actually becoming a place uh, where it transcends, you know, the politics of the day and people can learn. And, and, and the funny thing, as you mentioned, Bob, is that there is this common ground between left and right. And it's about Americans feeling disconnected from their foreign policy in Washington, sensing that there's just something wrong in Washington. Yeah, it's a swamp, it's a blob, it's a hive, whatever you want to call it. But they're feeling as though that they don't have any real impact on what their country is doing in foreign lands in their name. And except for a half of a percent of Americans who are actually serving in these wars. And so they're carrying all the burden and we're seeing all these decisions being made in Washington. And we're being told, you know, that's okay. Or pat on the head. The experts have it. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, we got this. And there's this, you know, this this lack of faith and trust in our institutions. And I feel that th th it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. You're feeling this, and it's visceral. And so you want to go to a place and read about these issues and bone up on them without feeling as though it's part of an agenda. And um, so that's that's what I've tried to do. And I don't think there are many places on the Internet today online that you can go where you can just feel like you can just leave the crap of the politics mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that's that that's what I'm trying to do. And I, and I do feel like I'm getting some good feedback and um, I'm getting the feedback because I think people are tired of the, the polarization. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, just in terms of things that both left and right could be outraged by if they thought about it, it's like I was just thinking, you know, the New York Times has been reporting on these drone strikes uh, that we didn't know about. I just thought the very idea that the government can take my tax dollars, use it to just kill people in various countries, and they don't even have to tell me about it. If, right. if these are CIA strikes, 
they basically, uh, you know, there's two kinds of drone strikes, CIA and military, and the military are closer to being transparent. But basically, we just don't know. It's like, okay, kill whoever you want. And you don't even have to tell me that's nuts. Okay, so let's um, let's let's get into uh, into the year uh, in in foreign policy. I don't know. I, I I didn't actually ask you to prepare. And and if you don't if you don't if you don't have like any kind of story of the year you want to nominate or anything, I've I've got kind of four stories in mind that you know if I go back and think about the beginning of the year, kind of when Biden took over, uh, where we were. Uh, there's a kind of a natural sequence almost. Well, there's three, there's three big things I think of. And then there was one thing that was kind of in the, in, as background noise, uh, transcending them. And, 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 and if either of you wants to start talking about the year interview, just go ahead. And if not, I'll, I'll start laying out, uh, the framing I had. Uh, sure. I, I can give it a shot. Uh, so yeah, so one of the stories, I mean, I write about it fairly often. Uh, the, the story that I, I keep trying to call attention to, of course, is, is the war on Yemen, the Saudi coalition intervention in Yemen uh, uh, that began, the intervention began in 2015, the civil war began the year before. Uh, the U.S. has provided uh, varying levels of support for the Saudi coalition over that time, uh, but it is still providing weapons, it is still providing uh uh, essentially uh, logistical backing. Uh, the, the Saudi Air Force relies on U.S. logistical support and maintenance, uh, and, and all of that is continuing to this day. Uh, and and I, I Although Biden re- cl- talked as if it wouldn't. He said he was not right. going to give aid, d- d- support offensive operations or weapons at the Saudi. D- of course, there's a very fine and blurry line between offensive and defensive capability. But anyway, right, Biden he, claimed to have changed the storyline and you're saying he didn't. He, well, he, he didn't do he didn't do enough. Certainly, he, yeah. there, there may have been uh, some weapon sales that didn't go through as in, as originally planned under Trump. Uh, but then there are new weapons contracts that are going through now. Uh, that the Biden administration uh, defends, as you say, as as defensive weapons, uh, mm-hmm. and there there are good reasons to think that that's not really the case. Uh, for instance, these air to air missiles that were just uh, that are just being sold to the Saudis uh, are instrumental in their ability to enforce their air blockade of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Bill Hartung has written about that uh, pretty extensively to to make the case that if you're enforcing a a starvation blockade, a killing blockade of a country then providing the government that does that with weapons is not defensive. You're, you're mm-hmm. enabling their ability to continue strangling that country. And uh, the, the UN just came out with their estimate of how many people have died from the war uh, earlier this year. They, they said by the end of 2021, uh, the war will have claimed some 377,000 lives, and the, the large majority of those will, uh, will have been civilians uh, killed by indirect causes of, of starvation and disease. And so those are, uh, that, that's the, the death toll that has racked up over the years. Uh, and of course, there is, uh, there is famine now in Yemen. Uh, there are tens of millions of people uh, who are extremely food insecure, uh, and their conditions are just going to keep getting worse. And of course, there are also uh, multiple epidemics and COVID as well. Uh, so uh, Yemen continues to be uh, ravaged uh, by the Saudi coalition, uh, and unfortunately, our government is not really uh, helping to to put a stop to that. They, instead, they're helping the Saudi coalition to keep do, keep going, and so that's that's been uh, both. I think one of the most important stories of the year, and it's also been one of the most disappointing parts of the Biden administration's foreign policy, because there was initially some real hope that once Trump was out, mm-hmm. uh, that the the new uh, anti war uh, forces that had fought against Trump uh, during the last couple of years that he was in office uh, were actually going to push Biden to finally wind down our involvement and wind down the war. Uh, and and it's been very uh, disappointing and frustrating to see that that hasn't happened. Uh, uh, another, uh, a much less well-known story, or probably one that's, that's sort of fallen through the cracks, but one that I think we need to be paying attention to is the Biden administration's failure to overturn Trump's recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. And this was one of those last minute things that Trump did uh, essentially as a favor to Israel uh, and also as a, as a free gift to the Moroccan government. 
the Moroccan it, government. It was a favor because that uh, drew Morocco into the Abraham Accords or what? Yeah. Remind that me. That was, yes, that was essentially the, the trade-off that by giving that recognition of Moroccan sovereignty, yeah. that Morocco and Israel would then improve their relations and, and establish more normal relations than they had had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a, a major reversal of U.S. policy. Uh, it, it amounted to recognizing an illegal occupation uh, that Morocco has been running for decades. Uh, and it was, uh, it was basically done simply as, as a, a transactional move uh, to, to get that deal between Morocco and Israel done. There was no consideration for, obviously, for the rights of the Sahrawi people who are under that occupation. Uh, and that's also generated a lot more friction between Morocco and Algeria. Uh, and, and tensions have actually been rising uh, between those two countries uh, in the ensuing months. Uh, and we've actually had, uh, there was a, an incident where the Moroccans blew up some trucks were traversing uh, through Western Sahara. Uh, anyway, so there, there, are, uh, there are problems uh, coming out of that decision uh, that I think have largely been neglected uh, because it's, it's a fairly obscure issue. Uh, and now that Trump's out of power, uh, the, the, the scandal of that decision has kind of been forgotten. And, mm -hmm. and Biden has been let off the hook for that. Um, and it's, it's I, I think that's uh, really regrettable. Yeah, well, um, I, even at the time, it didn't get as much publicity as one might have hoped. What you're calling a scandal never, never, never assumed well, those proportions in, in the real media. But, uh, right. but yeah, we agree. Uh, the um, Kelly, are those, have those been on your, on your radar screen? Uh, and do you have, uh, are, are there other, uh, other big, big stories? Yeah, just to, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to to sort of further Dan's thoughts on that, I'm you know was listening to him, and I realize how frustrating it's been uh, for many of us how status quo Biden has been. And I think you know you mentioned the Abraham Accords. Well, you know, uh, take it or leave it. They uh, the Biden administration has embraced those accords. Uh, it's as though they haven't even questioned whether or not they're gonna be effective or what their long-term impact might be on, on the region, uh, and, particularly. And we remind, let, me, let me just remind people quickly, I mean, that amounts to getting some countries historically at odds with Israel to establish relations with Israel, mainly Arab countries. I mean, maybe entirely Arab speaking countries. Um, and, you know, I, I can see how it's kind of like, it sounds like what's not to like, Right. But, but Daniel has pointed, though, to one major uh, trade off it involves. So so anyway, I, I think in terms of why I I guess one reason I'm not totally shocked Biden stuck with it is it's like, how do you come out again? In and in, especially in the American political system, something that seems like, well, more countries the, that were enemies with Israel are going to be friends with Israel. But anyway, go ahead, Kelly. Right. But it also leaves the play of the, the, the Palestinian people um, off the table. Uh, which is one of the major criticisms of these uh, Arab um, Abraham Accords, but it also creates mm -hmm. a sort of um, uh, an arc as a security hedge against Iran, which I feel that's the real uh, nub of these accords. Is an, it's a, a way for Israel to to bind itself with Arab countries who are already lined up against um, Iran and to solidify that hedge. And that is, it, 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 at least the Trump administration felt that that was the way to go. I'm disappointed that the, the Biden administration hasn't thought through uh, the implications of these accords and are thinking, aren't thinking more creatively on how to engage Iran, because this is obviously designed to isolate Iran. And if that's what it wants to do, fine. But I think that there had been some hope uh, that the Biden administration uh, would have more interest in diplomatically engaging with Iran. And so far, uh, even putting the, 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 the uh, Abraham Accords aside, the, the getting back into the JCP, JCPOA, which is the Iran nuclear deal uh, that Trump ripped at us out of, uh, that's been uh, sort of in stasis too. And there has been many criticisms about the Biden administration's inability to get back into that deal and to be indulging more of the hawks 
um, demands uh, uh, for is for for Iran in, in terms of wanting a longer and stronger deal and to put more mm-hmm. things into it and and ha- and haven't haven't really um, been really putting in the the elbow grease into getting back into that's another status quo that I I think is a big uh, you know disappointment. Also, Syria. We still have 900 troops in Syria. Uh, the Biden administration has said most recently that it doesn't plan on getting out of Syria. It doesn't plan on getting out of Iraq, even though our troops are a target uh, for uh, militias out there and continue to be all the way up until this week. There was a rocket attack near the near the um, the green zone in, in Baghdad. Um, the sanctions in Cuba and the embargo, there had been tons of, of, of hope that Biden would just go back to yeah. the Obama administration policy in which he lifted the travel embargo and other restrictions on uh, Cuba that had been put in place since the, the Kennedy administration. And so far, the Biden administration has not done anything on Cuba. But uh, Dan mentioned the, the arms deals. We, I mean, there have been a lot of effort into thwarting the the deals that were inked by the Trump administration for Saudi Arabia and UAE. Looks like they're both of those are going to go through. Um, Dan talked about Yemen. So I just think that, they, that more broadly, there it's been a year of disappointment that the Biden administration seems to be just taking the Trump administration. And they're like Trump light. They don't have the bombast of the Trump administration. And, and uh, we, we could throw China in there as well. No tariffs have been lifted. And and if anything, more tariffs and restrictions and sanctions have been imposed. And so I don't know. It doesn't seem to me much of a difference between the two administrations other than tone and the language that's being used. Yeah, you mentioned Iran. I mean, that was certainly on my list. And when I think back to the last year, that was maybe the biggest foreign policy question I had going into the Biden administration. And I was relatively optimistic. In principle, it was pretty straightforward, right? We are the ones who got out of the deal. Uh, Trump got out of a deal that was working very effectively. It had, it had succeeded in, you know, subduing tensions, you know, for a while before Obama did this deal. There was concern that Israel was going to attack Iran. There was, you know, so, uh, but now this was very ongoing verification that Iran wasn't up to anything funny. It was working. And moreover, it was part of Obama's legacy, which Biden, you know, (laughs) Biden, I think, was in that White House. And yet from the beginning, they the administration just didn't do the obvious, seemingly obvious thing, which is to say that to Iran, okay, let's go back to the status quo ante. Now, I know there were some details that were that were a little complicated sanctions wise. And but it wasn't they didn't they didn't come anywhere near trying to say to Iran, look, we're the ones who screwed up. The United States reneged on this deal, basically. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to where we were. It was working. Uh, you know, we're going to we're going to take off the sanctions. I don't have any doubt that Iran would have said fine. And and, and in fact, that might have uh, that might have prevented a, a more hardline uh, president from from coming into power down the road if if we had uh, given some vindication to the moderates in Iran who had supported this deal in the first place. I don't, I don't totally understand why, what was going on with the Biden administration there. I, I don't know if you, if, if either of you has insights. I, I don't have any inside information, but I, my, my impression from what I've seen and from what I've heard from them publicly is that they were, I think they were very wary of antagonizing hawks in Congress, and they were very wary of antagonizing regional clients, especially Israel. And so they they walked on eggshells and they, they approached mm-hmm. everything very slowly, very uh, you know, almost afraid to do anything that might create the impression that they actually want diplomacy to succeed, when of, when of course that was supposed to be their calling card. They were supposed to be the the competent adult administration that was going to get back into the business of doing diplomacy. And you know, unfortunately, I think because of that that fear of political backlash or political opposition, uh, they they were very uh, overly cautious, uh, and and so they they kept insisting that 
the, the ball, they kept, they like to keep using the same metaphor. They say the ball is in Iran's court. The ball is in Iran's court. When it was incumbent on us to, to make the first move, I think. Right. To, to, to break the impasse. Uh, because it, it should have been, you know, obviously it didn't happen, but it, it should have been fairly easy to at least offer up some minimal sanctions relief up front uh, as, a, as a gesture of goodwill to prove that this time the U.S. would actually make good on its right. promise. And, and I think the, the way that a lot of people in the Biden administration and Washington more generally think about sanctions is if you give them sanctions relief first, then that's a, that's a giveaway, that's a freebie, and you're not supposed to reward bad behavior. Even if failing to provide the sanctions relief leads to more of the bad behavior that they claim to be worried about. Uh, one of the things that's been very frustrating to see over the last year is how very predictably Iran has expanded its nuclear program in response to continued sanctions pressure and sabotage attacks uh, from Israel. And so we, th th this is all pretty predictable that Iran would respond this way because this is the way they responded to the increase of pressure the last time. And they built up their nuclear program the last time uh, as a way of building up their own leverage. And so the longer that you leave the sanctions in place, the, the more time you're giving them simply to expand their program. You're not gaining anything by keeping the sanctions in place. Right. And, and I, so I, I think that, that, that bad thinking about sanctions relief has really uh, poisoned everything. And, has, and then that lack of sanctions relief gave Iranian hardliners every excuse to drag their feet once they, were, uh, once they had taken over. Yeah. Kelly, do you have any thoughts on uh, what, what was going on in the Biden administration or? Uh, I mean, I, I just think you have two two different uh, constituencies within the administration. You have the progressives and then you have the the old school internationalist blob types. And I, I find that those two are constantly in conflict. Who are, the who are the progressives? I mean, I can I can think of like I would think of Rob Malley, who was involved in the Iran negotiations as relatively progressive. I assume you're saying Blinken, the secretary of state and Jake Sullivan, national security advisor, are uh, are part of the blob. I, I, I do feel that way. And I mean, they have a record to prove it. They're, they're, they're certainly blobbier. Yeah, they're definitely yeah. blobbier. And so you have this conflict. Uh, between those two constituencies and one constituency, which I, I, I was just reading in the, the New York Times, is very apparent in this argument about why we are not releasing more funds for the Afghan people right. and why we are uh, dragging our feet on opening up channels with the Taliban in order uh, to get the people who we are supposed to be protecting and liberating much needed health care and food and other aid. And from what I from what I read in the New York Times, there's there is a debate going on within this administration. And many people in the State Department are saying, open it up, open it up. You know, we have differences with the Taliban. Yes, we want girls to go to school. Yes, we want them to come through on their their pledges to to be uh, more liberal and, and, and more tolerant and all the rest. But this is urgent and we need to get this aid through. But then there are folks in the Treasury Department that say, no, we can't do that because we have these sanctions and we're not going to lift them until they, you know, until they, um, you know, comply with uh, some of these, um, you know, restrictions that we put up in terms of their behavior. And so I do feel that that the 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 administration came in with this handicap of having, um, you know, and th that's fine. And you could say, it's, you know, in a thriving democracy, you're going to have different points of view and whatnot. But let's face it, the Biden administration said, A, they were going to get back into the JCPOA. This is on the campaign trail. They got they were mm -hmm. going to get back in the JCPOA. They would help to end the war in Yemen. Um, they would transform um, uh, their, their policies that, on Afghanistan and in the wars and in China. And, and they they conveyed um, this um, this uh, this you know, uh, approach of doing everything differently. And then they come in. And it's like, it's all muddy, it's mixed messages, it's confusing. And I think that they, they had a obligation to mm -hmm. come through on at least a few of these things and they haven't. And I'm sorry that there's all this conflict going on, but Biden needs to take charge. And, and we can talk about Russia, we could talk about China, but everything has been confused and muddied 
And I'm happy we haven't mentioned it yet that we got out of Afghanistan. I right. think that was the greatest foreign policy story of the year is that we finally ended the U.S. military role in that war. Um, but the way it was handled was absolutely atrocious. I feel like the administration had not been um, prepared for the, uh, the takeover of the Taliban, had not um, been prepared for what Ghani would do in fleeing the country and leaving that, uh, leaving that vacuum. Um, I feel that there was a lot of blame game going on. Everybody's pointing fingers at whose fault it was. And, um, and so I feel like that, I, I you know, this whole idea that the adults were in the room now and um, the, you know, the old guard is gonna come in, I feel that that was completely blown out of the water with the performance uh, by the administration in, in Afghanistan. And I have plenty to say about the, the military as well. I think there are some good things that came out of that withdrawal, not just the withdrawal, but I think we, we see now that the, the, the American people are, are quite tired of war, um, that they have, they're losing faith in the military. Um, that they feel betrayed with the way that the military kept us and helped and, and the civilian, you know, um, officials as well, but kept us in a war for 20 years that they, they knew that we know they knew was not winnable. Yeah, I think we should give Biden, you know, credit for the withdrawal itself. And I, and I want to talk about that. I, I want to first say that what we're doing right now in Afghanistan is just so typical, it seems to me, of U.S. foreign policy. Our rationale, the official rationale, I mean, there is this bureaucratic issue with the Treasury, as you mentioned, but the, to the extent there's a rationale for not uh, permitting international aid to flow to Afghanistan that was flowing, you know, from the IMF, World Bank, whatever, and for not uh, releasing assets that belong to the Afghan government, which, like it or not, is the Taliban now. We are freezing assets that don't belong to us, that do belong to them. And to the extent that there's a, an ideological rationale, it's a humanitarian one, okay? We, we want to, and as you said, Kelly, it's, it's, it's a great and, and noble aspiration to want to, uh, for, to, to let more, have more girls going to school in Afghanistan, women's rights broadly, all kinds of other things. But right now, we are on the verge of having a lot of people starve to death. And we, and we are justifying the policy in humanitarian terms. And, and it's just, this is so common. We are we are punishing the Venezuelan people right now to help the Venezuelan people. We are right. punishing the Cuban people to help the Cuban people. We intervened by proxy in Syria to help the Syrian people and in the process got way more of them killed and, and created way more refugees uh, because we, we basically fanned the flames of a civil war. We do this time and again. And it seems to me, you know, we talked about overlap between left and right uh, critiques of foreign policy. It seems to me this is so fundamental that that both on the left and the right, we want to say, look, you just kind of have to let governments run their countries by and large. And sometimes this is, can become a very uncomfortable subject. I hope we have time to talk about China, because that, that that's one of the places where it's toughest when you see what's happening to the Uyghurs. But there are just so many areas where it's a much easier call than that. Right. It's like. There's just no doubt that the humane thing to do right now in Afghanistan is let the funds flow. And and so I I, I mean, because time is finite, I, I, I'm going to resist the temptation to dwell on this critique unless you want to contest it. Uh, Daniel, it looks like you want to say something quickly. I just I just wanted to add the what, what we what we're seeing with this debate over Afghanistan and, and whether or not to release the assets and, and to resume aid. And to, and to suspend sanctions. I mean, it's really the sanctions that are the the critical part of this because once the Taliban took over the country, then the sanctions effectively apply to the entire country now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that's that's what's really uh, crippling humanitarian assistance and it's it's making normal uh, economic activity uh, much, much harder. Uh, what, what we see here is th this uh, clash between uh, people who approach foreign policy and, and judge foreign policy uh, based on our intentions versus people that look at it based on outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there are a lot of people that look at the imposition of these cruel and, and unnecessary or excessive sanctions on many countries, and they think, well, we mean well. We're trying to improve the regime's behavior, and therefore uh, anything bad that happens along the way is just an unfortunate side effect of that. Uh, when those of us that look at the outcomes uh, see 
these policies contributing to impoverishment, mass starvation, the, the spread of disease. And we say that there's no justification for what's being done to innocent people, even if in theory your intentions were good, you're you're achieving evil ends. And so uh-huh. you you have to to look at what the policies are actually doing, not not so much why the policies were instituted, uh, and and then decide uh, what what it is you actually want to be doing uh, to these people. Uh-huh. I, and I also, I, I feel like the political considerations have taken over foreign policy. And, you know, I think everyone on this call does, we don't care whether the Democrats or Republicans win. I mean, I personally don't. I want to do the right thing. But I feel like Dan had said that, you know, that the Biden administration is not taking a strong stand on some of these issues, including, you know, releasing this aid because he's cognizant, or at least his his administration is cognizant of 2022 and 2024, and they're worried that they're going to look soft on the Taliban. They're going to look weak. And, uh, and I think that's the reasoning behind a lot of these things on the JCPOA, on China, on uh, lifting sanctions on the Iranians. You know, I feel like it, it, it's party consideration. And I find that mm-hmm. abhorrent to me because you are putting people's lives on the line. I, you know, we spend how many years, um, you know, during the, the presidential election cycle, you know, trying to decide which man or woman is going to run the country. And we've given them all of this power to run the country and make decisions for us. And then they get in and they can't make any decisions because they're worried about the election and they're worried about their party. And I'm thinking, yeah. wow, I thought we elected Joe Biden. And if Joe Biden, who is clearly at the end of his political career, can't make a strong stand and follow through, I find that, you know, I I just find that very disappointing. Well, I think for better or worse, he does currently plan to run for reelection. But that aside, I do I do think the uh, my sense is that on the, you know, the one thing they did, I can probably think of others if I tried. But the one thing they did that I clearly supported, which was getting out of Afghanistan, it seemed to me like that actually came from Biden. And, right. and, uh, and, and, it, and, and I think one reason it was, uh, mishandled, I, I mean, I think it was an inherently difficult thing to do. There yeah. was going to be trouble. There was going to be, you know, but, uh, there was going to be some chaos, but I think one reason it, it went so badly is because I think the whole blob, possibly including almost everybody in the Biden administration, except Biden probably didn't take seriously the, the idea that it was actually going to happen yeah. this time. Right. Because throughout the Trump administration, they're like, yeah, yeah, keep talking. You're going you're gonna to pull all the troops out of Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan. Sure, it never happened. Right. But because the blob is strong and, and, and the military industrial complex is strong and the whole think tank infrastructure is strong and, and, uh, and the various lobbies are strong. And I, I thought that was the one thing where Biden just said, no, I really want to do this. And finally, they were like, oh, well, I guess we're about to do it in like tomorrow. Right. And and uh, and so but but give him credit, you know, and I, I, can't, I I'm sure he didn't anticipate paying this big a political price and he didn't anticipate he didn't kind of think through the fact that kind of. So many journalists. Uh, including on progressive places like MSNBC, like the the ones who cover Afghanistan had gotten to personally know people who were sure. whose lives were going to be complicated by this. And they hadn't gotten to know the many people in the rural areas of Afghanistan who were like relieved by the fact that the war was finally going to end and who were basically fine with the Taliban's uh, moral values. Right. Or, or 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 at least would rather have peace than than argue about it. Um, but anyway, I, I, I do want to give him credit. You know, that was a big step. And, and I think part of our job is to, uh, to make it look like a good step in retrospect, notwithstanding all the blowback, uh, that they're getting and, and, and look, you know, but, but I got to just say quickly, the Biden administration, they're complicating their own lives. Because the public perception, to the extent that the suffering in Afghanistan now gets publicity, I think the public perception is, see, this is what happens when you withdraw. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't have to happen. It didn't right. have to happen. Right. And well, and, and, and really, it still doesn't. If, if they were to, to move quickly right. and, and to provide the, the necessary relief and, and to provide 
them with their own money so that they can actually have a functioning economy again, uh, many of the, the worst case scenarios might still be averted. Um, but, and, and, I, and I do give Biden credit for following through with the withdrawal because uh, it was extremely difficult politically. Uh, and it's, it is a, a testament to how warped things are in our foreign policy that it requires much greater political risk to end a bad war than it is to start one. And it's, uh, it is to his credit that he, he bit the bullet and, and took the hit for it because it was the right thing uh, for the US uh, and it was the right, and I think long-term it, it would be the right thing for Afghanistan, but we have to stop strangling Afghanistan with sanctions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, personally, I, I, think, I think there was a moment and I, and I, and I feel like you know, Dan and I you know, crashing the war party, Quincy Institute, Responsible Statecraft, we're all on the right side of this. There was this, this moment during the withdrawal where the media wanted, the mainstream media wanted to focus on the withdrawal itself and the chaos that was happening at the mm -hmm. airport and the tarmac and those, you know, the 13 um, service members who lost their lives and, and the Afghans who lost their lives in the bombing. They wanted to focus on that as, as a way, like you said, Robert, to um, to 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 signal, oh well, maybe we shouldn't have gotten out of Afghanistan. This is what happens when we leave a vacuum, and and what is this going to do to our credibility as a nation? And I feel like all of us on this call um, pushed back, and we made it about twenty years of lies in the twenty years of uh, extended war policy um, in terms of telling the American people that victory was right on, around the corner. At, you know, at every turn, every time, um, you know, a, a general stood in front of Congress and says, well, we just need more money. We just need more stomach for the fight. We just need to, to bring counterinsurgency to these places like Helmand province and, and, and Marja and, all, and government in a box and all, all the rest. And I think we continue to, to, to remind people that um, our 20 years and our trillions of dollars uh, and trying to stand up a, a, a military there and create a, a civil society uh, was all a Potemkin village. And that the withdrawal, the chaos that you're seeing was emblematic of a bad failed policy. And I think personally that we had some effect and, and, and we've had a, an effect because I think the American people are we're tired of the BS and that they could see right through the mainstream narrative that this was that we should have gotten out. And this is all, you know, uh, this, 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 this basically tells us we need to stay. Um, and I think by persisting, I think that it, I, I don't think that the American people are interested in going into any more foreign interventions, at least right now, that I can see because of what we witnessed mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Although that's good, a good transition to the uh, another story I was going to mention, which is Russia and Ukraine. There is, you know, uh, there is a certain amount of pressure to do something more forceful than I think uh, is a good idea. Uh, whether that's uh, a flood uh, flood Ukraine with with weapons or um, or conceivably even uh, get involved militarily in the event in the event of a a Russia invasion. Um, and, you know, I want to, I want to mention something, uh, I think probably all three of us believe that it was not a good idea to relentlessly expand NATO to begin with. Uh, this is clearly one of, uh, this is probably the biggest, uh, issue, uh, Putin has with the current situation in, in Ukraine. Um, and look, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't excuse his, you know, I, I am a stickler for international. I don't excuse his seizing of uh, Crimea or or fomenting the the kind of separatist rebellion uh, in the in the Donbass. But but uh, at the same time, when there are things you could do to prevent stuff like that from happening in the first place, you should do it. And I think a lot of us thought from the beginning, like, why are we expanding NATO? Clearly, at some point, Russia is going to start viewing this as uh, threatening. For example, when you start including former Soviet republics that are on Russia's border in NATO, we've already done some of that. He's worried that Ukraine uh, will will become that again. Uh, uh, there was, by the way, in a recent issue of my newsletter, non-zero newsletter, I, I dug up, and people can find this in the archives, but I dug up 
a story from 1997 in the New York Times about this group that had been formed with one of these nice names like Committee to Liberate the Peoples of the World or some bullshit. Anyway, the guy running it was from Lockheed or Raytheon or something. It was devoted to getting NATO expanded. This is 1997, and, uh, and it was well-funded. And, you know, the deal is that when countries become members of NATO, they have to buy, you know, there are commitments to buy arms that are compatible with NATO's system, which means buying them from American arms manufacturers. And, and this is the kind of influence on our foreign policy that I think the three of us are, are aware of. But, but nobody even thinks of this when you say, oh, Russia's amassing troops on Ukraine's border. Let, they're, they're bad. Well, they are bad. But, uh, you know, you could have seen this coming. And what's also bad is for American foreign policy to be completely corrupted by interests like arms manufacturers and various other lobbies. And that's my sermon. Now I, I turn the stage over to you, but clearly the kind of Russia-Ukraine thing is, is at the moment at least a big issue. I think it's one of the big, the big things of the year. It, well, it is. And I mean, it's been building all year. It's been, it's been uh, a, a growing problem. Of course, we, we saw the military exercises in the spring. Uh, that was the, the first scare when people thought that there could be an attack coming from Russia. Uh, and then that, that wound down and, and then it, it started up again uh, here in the, in the fall. Uh, and, and one of the things that's been consistently happening throughout the year is the Ukrainian government has been agitating to get a membership action plan uh, from NATO, which NATO has so far not provided them. Uh, but NATO continues to keep the door open to their future membership and, and essentially refuses to rule that out, uh, especially now that the Russians are insisting on NATO ruling it out. And we uh, issued, we actually issued a vague invitation of them to join NATO during the Bush administration. That's right, but, at the Bucharest summit in 2008. And, yeah. and that was also extended to Georgia. And uh, incidentally, that was one of the factors that led to the 2008 war uh, between Russia and Georgia then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this, this already has had destabilizing effects in uh, the wider region. Uh, and, and we're seeing that it continues to have destabilizing effects. Uh, we, we keep goading Russia with this promise, which I, I think is an empty promise, right? I think it's a lie that we're telling the Ukrainians. We're never actually going to let them in. There are too many European countries against it. it. It's never going to actually happen, but the Russians are afraid that it might. And the Russians uh, see Ukraine drifting into becoming a Western satellite with lots of US and NATO weapons in it, and that begins to make them nervous. Now, are, are they uh, reacting uh, badly? Are they reacting irresponsibly to that? You can say, I mean, sure they are, but, but they're, re they're reacting to something. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that we are partly responsible for by continuing to goad them about these kinds of issues. Now, the, the Russian proposals that have come out uh, in this uh, draft treaty that they've presented uh, are, are very uh, far-reaching. They're very extreme. I, I don't think uh, the U.S. or NATO could agree to at least half of them. Uh, but it, it shows that the Russians do have real security concerns. And, and whether you think their, their fears are uh, irrational or overblown, they are acting on those security concerns. So if you want to de-escalate the situation, you have to at least take some of them seriously uh, and to try to engage with them on that. And that there's actually a, a good piece on responsible statecraft this week or the, this past week uh, urging the Biden administration to do just that, uh, to, to try to find an off ramp. Because mm -hmm. right now it does, it does look pretty grim. It does, I don't know that the Russians would actually launch a full scale invasion because of the costs involved, but it, it is conceivable that they might conduct some uh, military action uh, using airstrikes or, or standoff weapons, uh, and then sort of daring other countries to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that is a real concern now. Now, Kelly, you, uh, by the way, we've, we're uh, at a little over an hour. Kelly, you were the one with the tightest time constraints. So I think you should uh, tell us uh, if, at any point if we have to wrap this up from your point of view. I certainly want to give you a chance to talk about this. And I would just add the other big year-end issue I, I had thought uh, is worth reflecting on is China. That, that just kind of has simmered in a, in a, in a sadly predictable way, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, between Russia and China, we've kind of gotten to the end of my list of uh, uh, 
uh, of things. But so, Kelly, anyway, say, uh, first of all, uh, let us know how much time we have. Well, you, you are in charge of time management now. So, uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, maybe and then maybe 15 more minutes or would that be okay? Sound, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I'm most d- disappointed with, I think, aside from all my other disappointments that I've already gone through. Um, a, lot, a lot of competition there, a lot, a lot of the competition. most disappointed Kelly this year. Yeah, but on, on this issue of, of Russia and China uh, has been the Congress, because I think there, you know, there had been some hope that uh, there were members of Congress, uh, that Congress itself might push back on the more militarized focus on, on foreign policy. And what I've been seeing in, in covering the, the budget debates, for example, I mean, we just passed, or the, the Congress just passed a $777 billion defense policy bill, um, which is, is extraordinary to me since that we just got out of a war, uh, that there was, um, you know, the Biden administration had proposed a budget that was a slightly higher than the Trump budget, and then Congress added $25 billion to it. And what I saw in the debates, um, whether it be on Russia or China, was this continued Cold War narrative that we had to continue to to arm up new ships, new planes, new technology to meet the competition of the adversary, whether it be the uh, pacing threat of China or uh, Russia and its encroachment of, of Ukraine. And the rhetoric has just not changed over 30 years. And I think uh, what you know the American people sense, and 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 rightly so, is that there are such entrenched interests, financial interests, in Washington to ensure the status quo of the budgets, increasing budgets, um, making sure that all of these weapon systems, whether or not they work, like the F thirty five, continue to be funded, and they use this, this rhetoric of us not being competitive with these other powers, that hasn't gone away. And so this, this idea that Congress might rise up and take back its war powers and, you know, and I'm so happy that there are still people in Congress like Bernie Sanders and Mike Lee and, and Rand Paul and uh, new people like Peter Meyer who actually care about war powers, but they are such in the minority. So when it comes down to these budget battles, you end up seeing these massive um, you know, uh, budgets passed uh, with no problem and any efforts to maybe thwart an arms sale to, to Saudi Arabia, you know, fall by the, the wayside. Um, and I think we need, I mean, so it's not just a, an executive branch issue. The Congress is still largely in bed with the defense industry and the military industrial complex. And when it comes down to it, they are going to vote with those interests and not with the American people's interests. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the budget is a big one. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's kind of mind boggling, uh, way more than Biden even asked for. And he, he's, uh, he's turning out not to be exactly a dove. The, uh, so China, um, let's see, I, I guess one thing I would quickly say is, as I said, I think it's a very difficult issue, um, because, uh, you know, What's happening, you know, what has happened with the Uyghurs, uh, you know, is is uh, is really hard to take. I think we I don't think we have as clear an idea as I would like about what has happened. I would encourage people to Google a conversation I had with a a, a guy named David Brophy, B-R-O-P-H-Y. He's he's an authority on this. And I tried to get as clear as I could about what what is going on there. Uh, I, I think that one thing I would ask uh, is that the, if the State Department is going to use a term like genocide, you know, do a whole report and tell us, like, what are the grounds for using a term like that? Uh, because uh, and, and one thing that bothers me about foreign policy discourse is you feel kind of apprehensive about even saying what I just said. Right. Like. Could we become, you know, can we just get clear on this? Because right away, people start saying, oh, you're a you're an apologist for this policy or you're uh, a genocide denier or something, you know. And 
you know, I think one thing that's happened is, is you know, the definition of genocide has certainly gotten broader in human rights circles since uh, after World War II. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, and talking to Brophy, I realized that it's a more complicated uh, uh, question than you realize. Well, for reasons I could get into, but, but certainly, I, I think at a minimum, it seems to me like uh, the term cultural genocide, I mean, that may be heavily loaded because the term genocide is inherently loaded, but at least I would say that seems to be a good description of what's going on. At a minimum, when you start destroying mosques and trying to kind of brainwash people out of their religious beliefs or whatever, and even here we're getting to an era where I'm not as clear as I'd like to be, but still, at a minimum, it's abhorrent on those grounds. It's abhorrent because there's involuntary confinement based on something other than people committing actual crimes, and it's large-scale involuntary confinement, even if they are eventually released. And so there's all kinds of things to complain about, but I'm afraid I have to be a stickler for always trying to get as clear as we can on what's really going on and what terms are appropriate. So, sure, no, I, I agree. We, I mean, we should be accurate in the language we use. And I, I think that's important to, to get right uh, because the genocide is very loaded and it, it can be thrown around uh, as, as a pretext for uh, interference in other countries' affairs. I, I think in the case of, of uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, uh, the, you are seeing a campaign of cultural genocide. You're seeing mm -hmm. the, the erasure of uh, Uyghur cemeteries, the destruction of shrines, the destruction of mosques, as you mentioned. Uh, and and you're seeing an attempt to try to, uh, I suppose, forcibly assimilate or force or suppress uh, the the native identity of, of the Uyghurs uh, to, to try to to make them conform uh, to more what the, the government wants them to be, and so uh, and and also uh, there's the angle uh, of using the the pretext of of opposing terrorism uh, to inflict this kind of collective punishment on large numbers of people in the community, and so that you know. If there is a a small incidence of uh, anti-Chinese terrorism coming from some Uyghur militants, that then gets used as a, a blanket excuse by the government uh, to engage in massive human rights violations and crimes against humanity. And so, uh, that you know, there I think we can we can all agree that they're what they're doing at least constitutes crimes against humanity. Uh, you know, whether it meets a specific legal definition uh, of genocide under the Genocide Convention. Uh, I suppose you know we can we can keep talking about that, but I I think in sort of the the the, the I mean plain... I would just interject that that gets yeah. into the birth control policies, which I realized in talking to David Brophy, it's just not as I mean China's birth control policies strike us as bizarre to begin with, right uh, across the board. It's like <laughs> telling everyone they can't have more than one child, and it turns out that uh, what's hard to distinguish is between what's being done to the Uyghurs and what's being done to to people more, 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 more broadly. I mean, I, I don't doubt that, that uh, there's something more forceful going on with the Uyghurs, but that's where things get blurry. As, as far as genocide, as distinguished from cultural genocide or whatever, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but, but anyway, go ahead. Right. And, well, and, and I think it's important to also keep in mind what's happening to other ethnic minorities inside China at the right. same time that this is going on, because you're, you're seeing campaigns to suppress or, 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 uh, or kind of drive out the use of local languages. Uh, th this is happening more and more in Tibet and also in Inner Mongolia, uh, where uh, Tibetan and Mongolian are being uh, actively uh, suppressed and, and discouraged mm -hmm. uh, through through official means. And so there there clearly is a some kind of, of policy to, to enforce greater uniformity across the board uh, to to the benefit of the majority uh, population. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kelly, I don't know if you want to talk about that. I, I think the question that we should say something about is, so what is, what is the appropriate policy? Of course, there's another set of issues with China, which is, are they expansionists? You know, there's their external behavior. And, and uh, my own view on that, well, go, I'll, you guys go ahead. and, and uh, Yeah, and I mean, just to get to your first question. I feel like I'm more comfortable talking about what is the inappropriate policy in response. I find, and, and this has been like this as an editor for the last several years, that there are 
the, the mainstream has distilled everything into two schools of thought. So if you are concerned about all the things that you and Dan just talked about, all the human rights violations, that somehow that you are a warmonger and that you're indulging in some sort of US propaganda and that you just wanna pursue a policy of either isolation or containment or if, at worst war with China and then you're using all of these concerns to gin up the justification. Then there's this mm -hmm. other school of thought that if, if you um, don't want that sort of policy, that you don't want war in, or intervention or containment, that you, you play down some of these things and that you, and, and, and some people do this in which they tend to ignore those things that are happening to the Uyghurs. Uh, they tend to be the most vociferous against the, the use of the word genocide or uh, the, the reports that come out about the, the, the detention camps. And um, I'm of the school of thought, which seems to be in the middle and, and, and uh, not as fully recognized that you can have it both ways. You can be critical of the Chinese government, not just to what they're doing in, in Xinjiang, but through the entire country, their authoritarianism, what they've been doing in Hong Kong, um, the total surveillance, um, the, whole, the whole bit, but not advocate a policy, uh, a militaristic solution, um, whether mm -hmm. it be containment or further sanctions or um, this idea of creating this security architecture to isolate China in, in, in the region. So I feel like, I feel like all the things that, that the, the Biden and the Trump administration have done with China are only um, backing them into a corner and making, their, making it worse, whether it be for their own people or for their neighbors in the region. And I feel like I'm not a diplomat, but my gut is that pursuing a more diplomatic course with China that does not include um, agitating them uh, in their own neighborhood is probably the best way. But I don't think diminishing what they're doing to the people and to uh, the Uyghurs is, is, is the right thing to do. And I don't, and I don't think um, advocating for more punishment is it, 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 what the, the Trump administration and P Mike Pompeo and others who used human rights to pursue mm -hmm. uh, aggressive uh, hawkish policies is right either. And who, who, of course, pay no attention to human rights issues in countries that we happen right. to be in league with. Like, uh, right. It's all Arabia. political convenience. Yeah. Right. When I, and that, I think that is one of the things that creates a lot of skepticism about these claims when, they're, when they are applied opportunistically and selectively only to adversary states and not consistently across the board. Uh, but by, by the same token, we, we ought to uh, apply them consistently uh, wherever we see uh, that kind of abuse happening. Uh, I think one thing, I mean, maybe a sort of a compromise position uh, or, or, or a policy that I think may have some uh, beneficial effect or is at least the, the right way to respond uh, is to identify those companies that rely on forced labor uh, in these regions uh, and, and to, to not, not just identify them, but to penalize them uh, for relying on that forced labor. And I think, I think individually targeted sanctions on officials that are engaged in these policies uh, within the Chinese government can be an appropriate way to respond. Uh, it, it, I, I, I rail against broad sanctions all the time because they're indiscriminate and because they attack the wrong people. But if you can actually f identify the people who are responsible for the, the offending policies, uh, then it's perfectly reasonable to to target them and to sanction them. Uh, it, it will arguably not make a huge impact on regime behavior, uh, but that's true of sanctions in general. Uh, but, I, but I think that is it is still the right way to respond. Right. It, it's it's kind of symbolic in effect. I mean, certainly the ones on officials. Right. right. Uh, but uh, but it's it's a way of saying something. And as you say. Sanctions almost never work in any other manner, except except as a symbolic communication, and they tend, broadly speaking, to make things worse. So far as we can, so far as the actual track record attests. Right. Uh, I mean, on the human rights front, I would say at a minimum, you shouldn't be like selling weapons to egregious human rights violators, which we right. continue to do. Uh, you know. Uh, 
but I guess I digress. Uh, you know, it's very challenging. I, I would say in terms of China's external behavior and Russia's external behavior, I, I do think there is a failure to, uh, on our part, to first of all, just say, well, they are pretty powerful nations. They have nuclear weapons. Let's see, what, they, what kinds of things, have, what kinds of prerogatives have we historically demanded as, as coming along with great power in terms of, you know, a non-threatening neighborhood and, you know, what would we, how would we feel if they started establishing inroads in Mexico or even, you know, South America and so on. I, I think the other thing is we sometimes fail to appreciate that things they do that we consider offensive, they may actually think of as defensive, you know, in the sense that we've got to control your neighborhood. We've always considered that defensive. Uh, and so on. But but that's my my final thought on Russia and China in terms of their external behavior, which is a separate question from the, I, I think, much, much dicier in a way, uh, area of uh, uh, more challenging area of human rights. Uh, any, so, so, Kelly, I think we're within two minutes of your designated stop <laughs> time. I, I just want to give you each a minute to say whatever you want. Uh, we should first plug your stuff again. You know me in newsletter, Responsible Statecraft, Crashing the War Party podcast. Uh, but but what else do you want to say? Uh, well, I'll I'll just go ahead and say uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Bob. Thanks for having us on. Uh, and just one last point about the Russian and Chinese behavior. We, uh, we often will tend to cast their actions simply as uh, the actions of inherently aggressive revisionists. Uh, without any consideration of of the role that our actions have played in fueling their fears or 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 driving their reactions, and so if we I think if we would recognize that role that we have, we could avoid at least some of the problems that we've had with them. Yeah, I mean, all I would say, and thank you, Bob, for having us. This is awesome uh, conversation, um, and very. <laughs> unwieldy because I know there's just so much to talk about and I and I hope you know we have more time at, at some point in the future. Um, but my goal for for 2022 is to really um, to, to use what my role is at the at responsible statecraft and crashing the war party to reach out to people outside of the beltway because I really think this year uh, really exposed a lot of the fault lines in terms of how the American people feel about their leaders, about the military, about Washington, about um, their foreign policy and national security. And I think the more that we can tap into that and to, to, to talk to people where they live in terms of how foreign policy affects them, you know, whether it be wars, whether it be budgets, whether it be you know, base contaminations here in the United States, the militarization of domestic security policy. I think the more that we can talk to people and make those connections, the more that they'll feel an investment maybe in what's going on. And maybe we could try to claw back control over these things. Um, we might not be able to do it right away because of the military industrial complex is so firmly entrenched and it's so huge. Um, but I think little by little, I think this is the moment. I think people are fed fed up with their institutions. They don't believe in them anymore. So let's try to give them something maybe to believe in. I know that sounds corny, but that's what I'm going to try to do the next year. No, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not big on corniness, but I, 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 do, I, I do endorse that particular goal. Uh, and, uh, and thanks to both of you for your work. Uh, I really, you know, the good news, I guess this has been kind of a negative vibe <laughs> conversation in some ways. But I do think, you know, there's there's real progress. There's a there's an alternative voice now. Uh and you two are important uh parts of it. So uh let let's just hope uh progress continues in twenty twenty two. You're here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.